Hello and thanks for choosing to listen to my talk. I'll be taking you through a study I did with Mel Ricketts and Phil Gilmer on structurally controlled low sulphide gold or orogenic gold in the East Riverina region. This area is Wiradjuri country. The Wiradjuri people are the traditional custodians of this country and maintain their connection to land, culture and community. I pay my respects to past, present and emerging Wiradjuri elders. The Geological Survey of New South Wales recently updated the mapping of the East Riverina region. The mapping was done between 2014 and 2018, and part of the project was producing mineral systems reports that cover the whole region, including what I'm presenting in this talk. The Gilmore Fault Zone cuts across the East Riverina region, shown here in red. It's a major crustal boundary and has been reactivated many times. Over 33 tonnes of gold have been produced or identified in occurrences along the Gilmore Fault Zone and other parallel structures, so it's one of the major controls on gold mineralisation. The first discovery of gold in this area was in Adelong in 1853. Since then, 23 gold fields have been defined and mining and exploration have been ongoing, producing $1.5 billion worth of gold. You can see the current exploration licences on the map here in blue. In the past, these gold fields have been studied by the Geological Survey individually or as part of, the, as part of a 250k map sheet. The study considers the whole region as one system, with an aim to describe mineralisation as one system across the whole area. Why would we want to do that? Well, despite the fact that mining and exploration have been ongoing in this region since before the Geological Survey of New South Wales began, our knowledge of the mineralisation is quite limited. Exploration for gold in this area is a bit like playing a game of battleship. Explorers in the mid-19th century were basically throwing a hole in the ground and hoping for a lucky strike, and indeed some of them were successful in discovering the major deposits. Since then, mining and exploration have largely focused on potential extensions to the lucky strikes, but this leaves the possibility of undiscovered battleships in the waters. Our role at the survey is to provide the data and draw some preliminary links to move exploration away from playing battleships and towards playing guess who. That is, if we know the characteristics of the mineral system, then areas of limited prospectivity can be strategically eliminated one by one. The more we know about a particular mineral system, the more we can narrow down the prospective area for a greater chance of success. This, however, requires a thorough knowledge of mineralisation in the area. Luckily for us, mining began in the East Riverina around the same time the Geological Survey was born, so we have nearly 150 years worth of survey reports and data to draw on, as well as reports and data provided to us by industry, not to mention the expertise of the regional mapping and mineral systems teams in the office. We use DIGS, which is our report system, and MinView, which is our web mapping application, to access this data and collated all the mappable components of the mineral system, which are shown here in boxes, for each of the 23 gold fields. We considered each component of the mineral system shown here with an aim to define kinematics, timing and mineralisation setting for each gold field. I don't have time to go through all of them but I will use Gong Gong as an example. There was very little information available that would help us infer a source of gold for these occurrences and this is true for many of the other gold fields too. It's certainly an area that could use more work in the future. Thanks to the geophysics and the mapping, Traps and transport for gold were much easier to determine. Here we can see unrecognised structures in the geophysics that may have transported gold-bearing fluids up through the crust. Gold is found here in splay faults in a pressure shadow next to the grung grung granite, which is here, where the change in fluid pressure may have caused the deposition of visible gold in quartz veins. Although there's no outcrop for us to examine, we can use a basic interpretation of the geophysics to estimate kinematics for these structures. They're similar in shape to a contraction duplex in a dextral fault, as seen here in the model on the right. We don't have any direct dating of the mineralisation either, but units along this structure have been dated and may allow us to estimate an age. Timing of the movement on the Gilmore Fault Zone is reasonably well constrained, so let me pull up that timeline as a guide. The grung grung granite at the bottom here is around 430 million years old, so we can eliminate the Benambran contraction as the mineralisation event. Along the northern extent of the structure up here are some deformed volcanic rocks which have been dated at around 418 million years. If this is the age of movement along this structure, 
then it's likely the bindian event was the mineralization event. Lastly, um, I grouped each gold field into three different mineralization settings. At Guang Guang, here we have gold adjacent to the intrusion um, forming in the pressure shadow. So this is classified as an intrusion margin setting. So I did that process for each of the 23 gold fields and then um, considered their similarities and differences to put together a summary of mineralization. As I mentioned, um, there are three mineralization settings. The first is shear vein arrays, like Reefton, which is shown here, or Adelong. These shear vein arrays, um, which are, are usually within a more competent rock type um, and adjacent to a recognized structure. The second setting is along the contacts between intrusions and metasedimentary country rock, like Grong Grong or like Tamora shown here. The competency contrast may have played a role in focusing fluid flow in these areas, with pressure changes during fluid movement resulting in gold mineralization. Lastly, there was one example by Medman where gold mineralization occurred within the hinge and limbs of a mapped fold. There were also a couple of gold fields where there wasn't enough information to decide on a setting, so definitely further work is needed there. Each of the gold fields is found along one of four major fault systems. Most of the production in the region comes from the gold fields along the Gilmore Fault Zone in the east, including Adelong and Tamora. Other gold fields are associated with parallel major structures, including the Naraya Fault shown here in blue. We used field relationships and kinematics of these structures to narrow down a mineralization age for each gold field, as shown in the Grong Grong example. And what we found was that most of the gold deposits formed in the Devonian in either the Bindian event or the Tavaravarin contraction. On this slide, I have a map for each major deformation event showing the faults active at that time, coloured by order, and the peak metamorphic conditions during the event. The peak metamorphic conditions were estimated across the entire Tabarabaran cycle, so the Bindian event and the Tabarabaran contraction have the same metamorphic maps. You can see that the same structures are reactivated multiple times, and peak metamorphic conditions occurred in the Devonian. I've displayed the gold fields according to the maximum and minimum mineralization ages we determined during our work, so some of them appear on more than one map. In most cases, mineralization correlates with subgreen schist to green schist fasces metamorphism and occurs in areas adjacent to first order faults. Most mineralization occurs in the Devonian, um, and there's a potential for remobilization of gold, particularly in the Canimblin contraction. Timing is really not well constrained, and again, this is definitely an area that could use more work. So moving forwards, although we uncovered and collated a lot of information on each gold field, there's still so much that we don't know. I've already mentioned timing and fluid sources, two areas that could use further work. But in reality, most gold fields are lacking even a thorough description of the mineralization assemblage and structural measurements of the ore bodies and the related faults. A new map sheet for the East Riverina is in the works, and that comes out next year. I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. Um, and encouragingly, there's been a recent uptick in exploration license applications in this area. Areas outlined um, here in pink are the new applications, and you can see that the exploration companies are branching out from areas of known mineralization um, here along newly mapped structures. The pandemic has really bolstered gold exploration in New South Wales, and I look forward to seeing um, the new information that comes from these programs. If you'd like access to any of the data I've shown in this talk, or any other geological survey of New South Wales data, please check out MinView, which you can find just by googling MinView. Accompanying the reports, including the report that this talk draws from, are all stored on digs, which you can find, again, just by googling digs. Um, and then once you're there, if you'd like to find my report, you can search for East Riverina or any of these details. Or of course, please feel free to get in touch with me and I can help you out. Thanks so much for listening to my talk and I hope you enjoy the conference.